I want to say welcome to everybody. It's a nice group of people here. It's good to see all of you. Uh, there's a few of you I've not been met. I have assumed some associations, but I'm not sure. But um, could I, I assume this is your mom? Yes. Christine. Nice. Christine, nice to meet you. I'm glad to, I'm to meet you. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, can you hear me now? So, so. Okay. I'll, I'll try to speak up well. And I, and I don't remember your name, I'm sorry. Lori. Lori, good to meet you too again. Anyway, it's good to see each and every one of you and tell your loved ones who are at home, especially Karen, that we say hello. It's good to be here. This is, uh, my wife and I, this is a, we have a unique challenge as with being a pastor family is that we, in the current situation in this world, are, um, we are good spreaders of, of, of sicknesses because we go to big groups. We go to that group here, we go to another group here, and another group here. And so anyway, one group we were in, and I mean, uh, one of my members in the district I was visiting, and then Sabbath morning two weeks ago, over to actually two and a half, uh, three weeks ago actually, they texted me and said that um, we are, co uh, we're two weeks, sorry, two weeks ago. Anyway, they texted me and said, look, we have COVID, and we were around each other for a few hours, I just had to let you know. I'm like, oh, great. So then I call the vice president of conference, asked them, look, what's our protocol? And they're like, you need to quarantine. I'm like, great. So this is the first time since I actually was with you last time that I, I get to uh, be together. So it's nice to be in church again. This is something I'm going to have to adapt to best I can. It's not my favorite, but we are doing our best that we can. And we're just glad to be able to be with you again and be able to see smiling faces on a Sabbath morning. I enjoy my family at home, but... I enjoy being able to have my church family too when we get to come together. So I pray that you're all doing well, the best that you can in the current situations we're in. Um, but at this point, I'm going to go ahead and just jump into the sermon today. It's called Lost and Unaware. And it's going to be a short, uh, it's a, a couple short verses and going to expound on them and then close. So hopefully it'll be a short, simple, hopeful message this morning. So if you can, just bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I want to thank you for today. I thank you for this chance we get to worship together. And Lord, I want to ask a few things this morning. One, that my voice would carry, that everyone could hear just fine. Two, that your Holy Spirit would speak to each one of our hearts and teach us the ways everlasting, that we may have hope, that we might have courage, and that we might have instruction. And Lord, the third thing I want to ask is that you would hide me behind the cross of Calvary, that Jesus and Jesus only would be seen, that he would be lifted up, and that I would be hid behind the cross of Calvary. As my prayer I ask in Jesus' name, amen. I have a question for you. How many of you have ever been driving and gotten lost? All right. That's okay. I can raise my hands. I've done it too. I'm about to tell you one of my worst that I've ever had. And it's, you know, your definition of lost, you know, it makes it hard to know if you, how lost you are because eventually you find your way home. Um, but it may just have been not the way you intended. One time I was, uh, I don't think, I, I wasn't married yet. It was about uh, six months before I got married. And um, I was my first time wanting to can applesauce. And there were these German Baptist family, which were known in the area for, um, they had or peach orchards, apple orchards. They were the best carpenters, etc. Anyway, when I got off work, about 30 minutes away was this family up in a town called Callaway, uh, 30 minutes from my house. And so I drove there. I picked up my apples and after it was at the end of a very long day of work. And so I'm heading uh, back home and I get to the first intersection. And it's a unique intersection. It's more of a Y. It kind of goes like this and there's a road like this. So it's not really, a, you know, exactly a T, north, south, east, west, etc. It's a, a unique way. And the way they put the sign for what road you're on, it's kind of like this, so you see both of them. So when you're at the one spot, you see the two signs, and if you're not careful, you can misread which one goes which way. And so I took the road that I thought I was supposed to take. It's the one that I thought I took last time. And after a little bit of driving, I was like, you know, I don't quite remember this that well, but you know, I've only been here once before, so we're gonna try and just go that way. So I'm driving. And I'm driving, and finally I get to an intersection, and it's a main highway. And I'm like, mm, we're in the wrong spot. This is not where I'm supposed to be. And I still remember the highway. It's on a green sign, white letters, um, and it said, you know, Highway 221. 
And so I took the turn. I was like, well, I'm, I'm, I, I took the wrong turn before. Well, I'll just take this shortcut this way. Instead of going all the way back, I'll just make a right and then get on the Blue Ridge Parkway. And then I can just get off on the main road going back home. So I get on that road and I'm driving a little bit and I saw a sign for Blue Ridge Park. I was like, you know, I think it'd be nice to drive on it a little bit. I'll take this route and then I'll head back home. And so I get on the Blue Ridge Parkway and the Blue Ridge Parkway is a very unique. All their intersections are almost, um, rustic is not the word, um, it's old style. It was, the Blue Ridge Parkway was largely built, um, if I remember, by Teddy Roosevelt's era when he was putting America to work and they had built all these highways and bridges and stuff like that. And anyway, they're very unique inter uh, on ramps and exit ramps that are there. It's kind of difficult sometimes to, once you get on to know which way you're going because the only time you see a direction sign, like if it says, you know, Blue Ridge Parkway North or Blue Ridge Parkway South is right on the exit ramp. But once you're on it, there's no longer any signs that tell you which way you're going. And it's 45 mile an hour and so I get up there and I thought I took the right direction again and I'm driving along and I'm just enjoying the beautiful countryside. It's fall time, the fall colors were out and it was just beautiful and I'm driving and I'm driving and I'm driving and I'm driving and as I'm driving I see a beautiful spot and I was dating my wife and I'm like, you know, I think I want to propose right there. And so I was like, yeah, I'll remember that. It's a beautiful spot right there. I can still see it. It's a valley, open, a view of the valley with this big kind of a knoll sticking out. It's kind of like a little, they call it mountains, but, you know, we're not that far from the west, so we know it's really just a hill, but that's what they called it. And anyway, so I remember going there, driving, and after driving for about 30 minutes, I was like, I should have hit the exit to Roanoke uh, a little while ago. Something's not quite right. But, you know, that was my, I didn't have good signal out there, so I couldn't really look up stuff. So I, I had no choice but to either turn around or keep driving. And so I kept driving, and all of a sudden I see the sign that says Dan of, uh, uh, Meadow of Meadows of Dan. And I'm like, that's not good. That's south when I was supposed to be going north. And, um, and that's quite a bit south. So now I know my only shortcut home is contact where my wife's landlord who had a cabin near the uh, meadows of Dan and they could tell me the quickest way home. And so I should have been able to get those apples and come back home within about a space of 45 minutes. I had been driving by this point probably two and a half hours and I had at least another hour home before I would finally get to my journey's end. Fortunately, I had a boxes full of apples so I had plenty of food to eat on the way, you know, for supper time. But um, I remember calling my, uh, my wife's landlords, who it was kind of interesting. They have a daughter, and her name was Sarah Little, so they would tease me about that. And uh, they had the same last name as mine. I think we're distant cousins somewhere along the, the grapevine. And uh, anyway, I told him where I was. He's like, how on earth did you get down there? I said, that's a long story. I was lost and unaware where I was. Um, but I've been enjoying the trip the whole way. <laughs> and so they give me my route. I find my way back home. And I remember finally getting home. And... You know, by that time, I'm tired and worn out. I'd already put in a full, long day of landscaping. And now, you know, when you're lost, there's a little bit of almost anxiety that comes along with it because you're in unfamiliar territory. You're not quite sure which way it is by this point. You could turn around and go all the way back, but you know that's going to take a really long time. And there gets to be a little bit of an extra little stress mixed in. Even though you're enjoying the, the, um, the scenery, there's just something about being lost that's no fun. And that was my case that October day. And um, it remind, as I was thinking of that story, I was reminded of another story in Scripture where there was, a, uh, there was something lost and unaware. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. And we're going to be reading verses 8 through 10. Jesus here is sharing some parables, and it's interesting, they're all lost parables. Something was lost, and someone was looking for them. And we find verse 8, it says, this is Jesus continuing on his story here, he says, Either that a woman having ten pieces of silver, if she loses one piece, doth not, and does, doth not light a candle and sweep the house, and seek diligently till she finds it. Now I'm going to push pause real quick because it's important to kind of understand here. This 10 pieces of silver is not just any kind of 
pieces of silver. This is not like you lost some pocket change. Oh, that was my favorite quarter or my favorite thing. This was very special money. During, during Bible times, this was often a gift that was given to the bride almost as part of her dowry. And in some places it was her dowry that was given to her. It was something very special and often the ladies would keep it to give to their daughter someday to pass it on as a dowry to their kids. It, was, it, became, it became almost like a family heirloom in some cultures. There was, a few, uh, how I said, different families did a few different things with theirs, but it was very special in all families, this kind of dowry money that was given to the daughter. And this was something of, of almost one of the highest values to the woman. And so when she saw one day she's cleaning house, she went to the place where the silver was kept and was looking at it and took it out and was dusting, counting it, and she realized instead of ten, there was nine. Now she could have said, well, at least I still got the majority of them. I still got nine. Um, she could have done that. But that's not what the parable tells us, because when you keep going, she says she lights a lamp, and she sweeps everything until she finds it. And then in verse 9, it says, And when she had found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. I'm push pause again. I remember when I read that the first time, like, that's really odd. Who in the world loses some change, finds some change, and calls their neighbors over for a party? I mean, I, I'm kind of happy if I was, you know, you know, back in the days when we spent all cash, there was no credit cards really or debit cards much, and all you used was that, and you had a lot of change. My grandfather had change, and he most time would take it all out of his pockets before he would sit down for the evening, but sometimes he would sit on the couch without doing that, and then, you know, as months go by, I would clean out the couch, and I'd be pretty excited because I found quite a bit of change in there, and there might be a little rejoicing among uh, siblings because typically if we found it, we tell grandma or grandpa, and they let us keep it. So it was something we rejoiced about, but it was just some change. We never went and told the neighbors, called the friends, hey, I found the change in the couch. We, we didn't do that. This money was something, again, very special. And this was something that every neighbor and every friend knew was a most prized possession. And this was something that when it was lost, you rejoiced over it with your friends when you found it. And in verse 10... The last verse to this parable says, Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over a sin, over one sinner that repents. Here Jesus, he was trying to take something that the common people understood with this dowry and their emotions, how they would feel if they would have lost it. And then their emotions once they found it and what they would do about it once they had found it in the rejoicing that would goes on. And then Jesus said, look, just like all the rejoicing you would do in this circumstance, even more so up in heaven, there is the angels, they are, the rejoicing they have and the joy they have when just one sinner repents. You know, that's incredible. You know, I, I, how can I put this? I'm going to try to be vulnerable, um, but at the same time, um, try to make this point. You know, when we have an evangelistic series or a big series of meetings and you put a lot of effort into it and a lot of money and everything else to it, and you're expecting big results and only one person comes or one person's baptized. You know, we're thankful for that one person, but if you really talk to all the workers, most of the time, not all of them, I've been fortunately part of some groups and uh, evangelistic efforts where there's great rejoicing over just that one. But most of the time, when a lot of effort has went through and a lot of money has gotten put into it, and one person is all that came and was baptized, everybody talks nice and happy to this person, which they are. But if you pull the group aside and kind of talk to them, there's almost an air of disappointment. It's like, man, we went through all that work, and there's just one. That's all we had. I mean, it was just like, as if the one wasn't really that valuable. I don't know. Um, well, I better not get sidetracked there. What I'm trying to say this, if all heaven rejoices when just one repents, it doesn't matter what price tag it costs to help someone come to Jesus. It was worth it. It was something that we can all rejoice about. And uh, as I was looking at, at this parable, I looked in a book called Christ Object Lessons, and I was looking at it in the Bible commentary and, and Scripture, and there were several lessons that I wanted to share with you this morning. And the first one that I wanted to share with you was this. Let me ask you a question. Was the coin lost? In this parable, was the coin lost? 
did the coin know it was lost? No, it's a coin. It's an inanimate object. It does not know where it's at, what it is. There's no consciousness to it, but it was lost. In our world today, this coin can be represented by sinners who have either never come to Christ, they've never known a better way, they're lost and don't know it, or perhaps even by a Christian who unknowingly by neglect of spiritual disciplines, prayer and Bible study, have drifted into a lost condition and don't know it. That often happens. They're lost, but don't know it. There's another lesson that I want to bring out about this, is that this thing, this coin was lost, but it was close at hand. It wasn't far away from where it was supposed to be. And when I was thinking about that, I was like, Lord, what lesson can I get? What lesson can we gain from that? That a coin can that this coin was lost, but it was nearby. And I thought immediately the home. You know, often we can have a Christian home. And I learned this a long time ago, and I'm learning it now because I'm having to train my little ones. And I've looked at families who the mom was a saint and the dad was a saint. And you would think when you look in creation, you know, you get two horses together and they have a horse. You have two fish and they have a fish. Or you have two dogs and there's a dog, or two cats and there's a cat. But you have two saints, that doesn't equal a saint. That little one is a sinner. It needs Jesus. They don't come out to be exactly like mom and dad. But some of that is praise the Lord, they're not. I'm glad there's some things my kids are not like me in. But there's some other things I'm like, Lord, that wasn't supposed to get passed on through the DNA. They weren't to feel as strongly about that like I did. You know, you know what I'm talking about. They doesn't, just because you have, you are trying to raise them the way you want them to be raised, sometimes life gets busy. Or especially in our world today, the world becomes chaotic in a way we've never seen before. And so much is happening here, hither and yon, that maybe some things start getting crowded out at home with the kids and family. And sometimes you can have lost coins in your house. It might be your children. It might be someone else living at home with you, or perhaps it might even be parents. They're close at hand, but lost. And this, as I was thinking about this, this made me want to, to focus more on making sure I don't have lost coins at home. You know, I know they're young, but I want to make sure they never get lost. I want to make sure they always know to find their way home to where, they're, where they can always find someone who loves them, not just me and mom, but God, to know that God is their friend. That's the thing that I want them to know always, that, look, you can choose to do wrong when I'm not there. I'll never know. But your guardian angel and Jesus knows. They're always there, and they're always trying to help you do right and to do, to do good. And this was another lesson that I was thinking about when I was, talk, when I was thinking about being lost uh, loved ones at home. You know, in our church family, that's our church home. And sometimes there can be lost coins in church. And sometimes maybe not in church. They were in church, but now they're not. And especially in our, COVID, our now post-COVID or current COVID, however we want to do it, a climate, there's a lot of people, a lot of coins, not at church. And that doesn't necessarily mean they're lost. But it also means it's, it might be difficult for us to know, are they missing missing or are they just a home trying to stay safe missing? Does that make sense? And that means we need to put forth earnest effort to make sure we're reaching out to those that are not here with us this morning. Even if we think we know why they're not here, it's easy to think, well, they're not here, it's COVID. And it might be. But it also could be that life was really rough right before COVID happened and it was just a convenient transition. And there might be some that they never intended to stay home. That's just what they had to do for a certain amount of time, but life hit them hard while they're home. Or we had to stay home so long that they broke the old habit and started a new one. We need to make sure that we're bringing our coins to church. And sometimes we can't bring them to church, but at least be keeping them together in prayer, reaching out to them, make sure they're here. And I challenge you, and I'm going to keep challenging you this in my sermons from here on out until if there's any kind of normalcy after this. If you see someone here you know that used to be here, call them when you get home. 
Just let them know you're thinking about them, that you love them, that you care about them. If there's anything we can do or pray for them. And if there's anyone here that maybe hasn't ever been here, but you say, look, they should be, call them too. There's nothing wrong to even going home. My neighbor knows I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. He sees me get dressed up every morning. He knows I'm a pastor. We wave and talk sometimes before I get to go to church. And I come home, he sees my family getting out. He knows. Sometimes I go just straight. I'll go right over there. They're outside and I'll talk. I'll try to engage. My point that I'm trying to get across, friends, is that Jesus has many precious coins that aren't where they're supposed to be this morning. He's wanting you to cooperate with Him and go search with Him for these lost coins. And one of the reasons why, is I want, this is going to be my, uh, my third point here, is this. Those coins, they were lost. And likely it was under the bed. And I don't know if you know about what ancient homes look like. Ancient, I, they wouldn't consider themselves ancient. But Middle Eastern homes back in the day, they were typically built out of dirt or earth plaster together, cake together. And when you're doing that, there's not a lot of structural integrity. So windows and doors compromise a solid surface. My wife had a uh, family had a big barn that was built over 100 years ago. It came as a Sears and Roebuck barn. And it started falling down or started having some problems, but everything was okay until this one side of the barn had many doors and openings and one of the foundation walls fell out. That on the other side where there wasn't as many windows and doors, the wall was still strong. So back in Bible times, you had very minimal windows, typically one. And you typically had one door. And so if you were going to look for something, you can open up the one window or the door. But have you ever tried to look in your house with no, if you had a, imagine having all your windows uh, covered up only having one window open and one door open, do you think you can see into the recesses of everything in your house? No, that's why she lit a lamp, which we know in Bible times, what we're in the scriptures, that often represents the Word. They, she had to light a lamp and go searching for her coin. And when she found it, it was covered in dirt. It was dusty. It had been lost. And when you have something lost, you know, I sometimes find something lost under the bed. And when I pull it out, it's not in that nice, clean condition when I lost it. It's covered in dust bunnies. You know, you would think that even though you, you vacuum, you clean, and you periodically clean what's out underneath the bed, you would think there's not that much dust under there. But I don't know how they conjugate, but there's just always tons of them there. So this coin was dusty and dirty. But let me ask you a question. Even though it was dusty and dirty, had its value changed? No. It was still a priceless piece of silver to this woman, and she... Got it, she polished it, she cleaned it, and then she went to rejoicing. Just like the many lost coins that are in our world today, they may be dusty and dirty. They actually might even stink. You know what I'm talking about. I remember an evangelistic series I was part of in Ukraine. And there was just this one man came almost every night. And you smelled him long before you saw him. Vodka was his number one drink that he preferred. And you could tell. He stunk. But he came every night, almost every night to those series. And he was one of the ones that wanted to keep being following up more, learning more about Jesus. We were founding, finding a lost, dirty coin, but it was still priceless. And one of the reasons why I know it was priceless, because when Jesus died for you and me, he has the highest value. Nothing else in the universe has as much value as Jesus. God has the ultimate value, and God gave... A God's life for our life. That's a priceless value. There's not enough currency on this world to pay for that. So every life that we come in contact with in our day-to-day -day work, our co-workers, our family at home, our family abroad, our neighbors, the people God puts in our life, God has given them to us and they are priceless in God's sight and God wants them to be priceless in our sight. This is something else that I, th I found that was interesting in this uh, lesson here. I mean, in this uh, parable, the lady lit a lamp before she went and searched for this coin. You know, you will be, we will be more successful in our finding of coins if we would light the Word of God first, the lamp that is a light unto our path. 
It will teach us how to reach out to each other. It will teach us how to be Christ-like, how to be loving, how to be kind. It will teach us how to listen to the Holy Spirit who will be whispering, hey, look, you're getting close. Go a little bit farther under this area. There's a lost coin this way. That's the nice thing about it, that God is actually wanting to work with us. The angels long to do the work that we do in finding lost coins. And they long to cooperate with us. I long to cooperate with them. This is something else that I found that was interesting here. The four, uh, this is probably my fifth or sixth les uh, lesson I found. Is that the woman started searching for the coin. When did she stop looking for the coin? When she found it. She didn't search for a little bit and like, ah, I'll take a break. You know, I don't, I'll find it sometime. She made it her supreme focus. You know, this one here challenges me because this is going to look a little different for each person exteriorly, if that's even a word, kind of, if I said that right. But inside it should be the same. That if we are in love with Jesus and we're wanting to follow Him with our whole heart, inside every heart when they come to Christ is born a missionary spirit. When you come to Jesus, you want to bring somebody else to Jesus. How can you keep something quiet that it means so much to you? I remember when I was dating my wife and when we got engaged and we first got married and even now, I was like, when I'm talking to new friends and stuff like that, my family are important to me. They're always on the top list of things I mention in my conversation before we're done. Typically, anyone that I meet, that if I have anything more than about 10 minutes to talk to at the most, they're going to know I have a family with two boys and a lovely wife. You know, that's the same thing with Jesus. When we come in contact with Him and He becomes the fairer of 10,000, we're going to want to share Him with those that would come around. We're going to be praying for opportunities, for divine appointments to find those lost coins. And God will answer those. And so, my friends, I want to encourage you, do whatever it takes to find the lost coins in your life your family, your friends. I was thinking about it this morning. I have some lost loved ones. I have one in particular that comes to my mind and I'm like, Lord, you know, I didn't pray for them several times last week. Why not? Why didn't I do that? It started making me want to dig deeper in my own experience saying, Lord, I want to have a deeper hunger for souls. I want to pray for my lost loved ones, my lost, these lost coins in our life, like I've not been doing. Oh, there's so much. Oh, there's so much. But I want to share with you my last lesson. And for this one to me is the most exciting of the lessons. The coin was found. Jesus didn't end it on a sad note. He's like, well, she looked and looked and it couldn't find it. It said it was found. Jesus here was teaching the lesson that if we will persist in faith and prayer, we will find these coins. We can find them. Jesus searched until He found us. And this is something that we sometimes don't realize, but do you realize you didn't go searching for God before He found you? Jesus went searching for you. And every one of these parables with the prodigal son that was lost, the father was looking for the son. He was sitting there watching for him day after day. And when he was a great way off, he came running for him. There was a lost sheep. Jesus went searching for the lost sheep in that parable because he's the good shepherd. You have the lost coin. The, uh, the lady who owned the coin went searching for it till she found it. There is an earnestness in all of these stories that show that if we have that same earnestness, we can find the lost coins in our life. And I was challenged also because I remember reading a story. There's a lady by the name of Ellen Harmon, who eventually became known as Ellen White. She was a very young lady when she first came to Christ. I think she was about 12 or 13, if I remember correctly, when she fully gave her heart to Christ. And one of the interesting things is that as soon as she had given her heart to Christ, she had an immediate desire to share her friends and have her friends surrender their lives to Jesus too. And so and I'll read to you what happened. She, she wrote in her journal that she had 20 friends. When she came to Jesus, there were 20 friends on her heart that she wanted to come to Christ and she knew they weren't walking with him and she knew they were lost and that they didn't know it 
and she determined that she would do all she could to win her friends to Christ. And so this is what she did. She got a few of her friends, and it says for the, let's see, can make sure I got, yeah, and she prayed, and give me just a second, make sure I got this right. She got her few friends, and the following day, they started praying earnestly for these 20 friends, and every day they met together and prayed for these 20 friends, every day. And they even um, fasted and prayed for these friends. And as the months passed by, one by one, the 20 of the friends began surrendering their lives to Jesus. And that at the space, I believe, over, of six months, in six months' time, you want to know how many of that 20 had surrendered their lives to Christ? Nineteen. Nineteen of them had surrendered their life to Christ. Now, and some of you think, oh, well, she was a prophet. She wasn't a prophet then. She was 13. She was still very young. And the interesting thing that even encouraged me even more on that story is that as those 19 had come, they joined in praying for the ones who hadn't surrendered their life yet. And a few years later, number 20 gave their life to God too. She had a 100% success rate. And I don't believe that was because she was so special. I believe it's because she gave all she had to, pre to, sharing, to praying earnestly and sharing her face with these 20 friends that she had. We're reading in During Prayer Meeting a book called Daring to Ask for More, and it's a powerful book. And there was a story of a man. I can't remember what country it's from. I believe it was in Africa. And he gave, literally gave his life praying for his friends. Thousands came to the truth because of this man's prayers. He didn't even know some of these people, but he would pray for a village or pray for a specific area. And he would sometimes spend days fasting in prayer for them. And, and, and quite frankly, we would say, and I even would say God would probably say the same, that he pushed his limits too far because he died way young because he died of an enlarged heart. And when, they, when the doctors heard of his whole story, they, and the intensity and the earnesty that he would put into his prayers for these lost people, they realized his heart had, died, had been enlarged because of the intense earnestness that this man had praying for people. I don't believe God is asking for all of you to die early from praying so hard. But I'll tell you this, when he gets to heaven, God's not going to shun him and say, look, you shouldn't have prayed that hard. But he will see all of these people who came to the truth because of this man's earnestness in prayer and Bible study. What I'm wanting to challenge you with this morning is think of a lost coin in your life. A friend, maybe a mother or a father, grandparent, maybe an aunt, uncle, a child brother, sister, you know who that might is. Lord will put them on your heart. Think of that person, and I challenge you this week, set aside a specific time for them to pray for their soul. My friends, I know if we will put forth the earnesty that this woman had looking for her coin, that Ellen White did praying for her friends, God will give us some of our coins back, if not all of them if we will put in that earnesty and searching for lost coins in our life. And again, right now we're in a time of life where when I ask almost anyone what's normal, used to they would give me a list of what was normal in their life. I ask anyone what's normal today and they're like, I don't know. <laughs> they don't. I mean, they're trying to get some sort of normal, but it's not normal. We don't know what it is right now, but there is one thing that is normal. To pray earnestly for your friends. Jesus still is still the same God before COVID, during COVID, after COVID. He's the exact same one. He hasn't changed. The angels are still there searching for us, help, trying to help us, to protect us. They're still the same. And the one thing that shouldn't change in our life is our relationship with God, except for getting better, and our desire to save the lost coins in our life. And perhaps this morning you might feel this morning that you're the lost coin. That finally you feel you're aware of your condition. I don't know who you are. I, from all of uh, you that I know, you're wonderful people. But I also know that as wonderful people, we can put masks on really well. I know I've done that a lot in my life. You don't mean to. It's just, you know, I know how I'm supposed to look, so I do what I'm supposed to look. But in the middle of the week, I'm just struggling. Perhaps you might be feeling that way. I want you to know Jesus is looking for you, and He's willing to find you if you'll just surrender to Him. So at this time, I'd like to ask if you would pray with me as we pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for today. 
I thank you for this wonderful group of people, all their smiling faces. I thank you, Lord, that in this parable of the lost coin, that the coin was found, that the lady of the house, who in this case represents you, did not stop until she found that coin. And Lord, a verse that's coming to my mind also is in Scripture how a woman represents a church, a pure woman. Lord, I can't help but believe that's part of the parable too, that God's church is to do all in their power to search and save lost souls. Help us to light our lamps and go looking for our lost coins, our lost friends, our lost loved ones, our lost co-workers, our lost neighbors, and bring them hope and joy and rejoice together when they come. And for those of us this morning that feel like we're the lost coin, Lord, we want to surrender to you and ask that you please dust us off from the dirt and grime of this world and place us with the other ten, with the other nine coins where we're supposed to be. Lord, we long for you to come soon. And for those of us, Lord, that we maybe don't even long that, Lord, help us to long for that. Help us to be willing to be made willing and to surrender our hearts to you. Lord, we love you, and we ask all these things believing in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.